All right, now let's get into the Mexican Revolution in more detail. So as you guys already know, it's a 10-year revolution. So of course, it's violent. It has a tremendous effect on the civilian population, killing off between 1.5 and 2 million Mexicans. And this is mostly due to disease and famine. It's actually not uh, as closely related to violent death associated with the revolution itself. Uh, so what triggers the revolution? So once Madero is jailed, there are a number of revolutionary forces that crop up in opposition to Diaz's dictatorship. And these opposition groups eventually are able to force Diaz into exile in 1911. And the competing goals, or rather the competing figures against Diaz have a number of different goals, and so they're not all aligned politically, uh, which also affects the way in which the U.S. sees the entire affair. And so one of the first revolutionaries against Diaz was Emiliano Zapata, and uh, he was a major supporter of land reform and led a peasant revolution in southern Mexico against Diaz. Uh, what he has in common is that with Pancho Villa, rather, is that he, too, supported the rights of rural peasants and workers, although Villa was seen as more to the left even than Zapata. Uh, Pancho Villa's revolutionary army actually seized haciendas, the large farms, throughout Mexican rural areas, and revolutionary forces actually both by Zapata and Villa helped contribute to the fall of Diaz, but the Zapatistas, after Madero came into power, were actually dismissed as bandits, actually same with the Villas. So what's really important for us to realize is that Madero uh, really breaks from the other revolutionaries once he becomes president. and. Carranza was seen as the most conservative of all the revolutionary forces. And one of the reasons why this is, is first off, that he used to be a supporter of Diaz. Uh, so therefore, he immediately, ideologically, was opposed by the Zapatistas and the Villas. Uh, Carranza initially supported Madero's challenge to Diaz for power in 1910. Um, and he's unable to prevent Madero's execution but when Madero dies, he soon rebels against Huerta, who was responsible for Madero's execution. And the U.S., because Wilson dismissed Huerta as a dictator, recognizes Carranza as president. So we'll talk about Carranza's presidency uh, in just a moment here. But it's important for us to realize that in the midst of all this chaos, uh, about 10% of the Mexican population moves to the United States. So again, you can just see that the sheer violence and the ideological confusion during the Mexican Revolution leads directly to migration. As far as the outcome of the Mexican Revolution was concerned, Carranza ultimately was successful. Uh, his revolutionaries, again, were called the Constitutionalists, and they were supported in part by the United States because Wilson's administration opposed Huerta. And so they eventually, his revolutionary military, controlled most of central and southern Mexico, which was where the capital was located, of course, in Mexico City. And he eventually defeated Huerta's forces. And then Carranza and the Constitutionalists ultimately established themselves as the head of the Mexican government. The most significant accomplishment in this stage of the revolution was the Constitution of 1917, although it's important for us to realize that the fighting in the revolution continued for an additional three years. And so many of the provisions of the Constitution did not actually come to realization for years afterward. So the first major provision of the Constitution was the nationalization, uh, or yes, the nationalization of resources, specifically oil. But just like I said earlier, it took a while for these things to materialize. Foreign oil companies were not actually expropriated from Mexico until 1938, and that was when Lazaro Cardenas was president. Another provision of the Constitution was to call for separation of church and state in general to weaken the power of the Catholic Church over the political sovereignty of Mexico. It required religious institutions to pay taxes, and in general... Uh, the fear of the Mexican government was that the Catholic Church 
would uh, continue to be anti-nationalist and anti-Mexican sovereignty. It was seen as an obstacle to progress. We'll also talk about how the separation of church and state was meant to influence education in just a sec. Uh, The Constitution also provided for the protection of rights of workers to form unions and to strike. Additionally, one of the major goals of unionists was to gain an eight-hour workday and to end child labor and also to gain certain work holidays. Education reform, as I said before, there's a connection to the separation of church and state here. The Constitution called for a free, mandatory, secular, meaning non-religious education. It also mandated school attendance from age 6 to 18, and it had a dramatic effect on improving literacy over the years. There was also a call for moderate land reform by the Constitution, It uh, intended to limit the amount of land that an individual could own, and it also legalized the federal government's ability to redistribute land to smaller communal farms. But again, this does not fully occur until about the 1930s, when you see a much more leftward push by the Cardenas government. So how does the Mexican Revolution ultimately further impact migration from Mexico to the United States? So in the years during and after the Mexican Revolution, so between about 1900 and 1930, uh, turmoil in Mexico continues. And uh, this is largely because the increase of agribusiness, right, large-scale farming, will contribute to, again, a deterioration of small farming. This is largely because increasingly small farmers are losing more of their land Uh, This is largely because the ideals of the Mexican Revolution are not carried forth, and we won't see that until Cardenas' presidency in the 1930s. Some of the push factors that contribute to migration. We already talked about the transformation of the Mexican economy when Diaz was president, right? As foreign investment continues, this leaves many peasants increasingly landless. And because the United States supports Carranza's presidency, Uh, The increase in foreign investment actually continues once Mexico returns to stability in the 1920s. And of course, one of the other push factors is the the major amount of fatalities that occurs in Mexico. Again, we said about 1.5 to 2 million people die as a result of the war, and 1.5 million alone of those people largely die due to famine and starvation. So, uh, of course, when you are resorted to those kinds of conditions, often you seek another place to live, and another place to work. Also, there are pull factors. Again, as we discussed, there's more opportunities in agribusiness, uh, and also mining, and also uh, other industrial production, and these are largely in border regions, either in the southwest United States or also in the northern areas of Mexico. So again, we're just seeing a large amount of migration and immigration. But there's a large-scale consequence to this, and that is once we get to the years after World War I, U.S. immigration policy is going to increasingly take a nativist or anti-immigrant turn, and we'll talk in the next slide about how certain forms of legislation actually contribute to a discouragement of certain types of immigrants to the United States, and of course that's also going to lead to increased racial tension between different groups in the U.S. Another reason why there was a major push factor for Mexican immigrants into the United States was that there was sweeping nativist anti-immigration legislation that was passed in the United States in the World War I years and also in the 1920s. And so the 1917 Immigration Act, you can see that the language is very vague and obviously very discriminatory, and I'm not going to read all the different types of groups that they're trying to ban from migrating into the United States. But in general, they're actually targeting people from specific parts of the world and trying to discourage their migration. So most specifically, the 1917 Immigration Act barred immigration from the Asia Pacific Zone. And so Chinese American or Chinese immigrants, Japanese immigrants, uh, Filipino immigrants, they were increasingly discouraged from entering the United States. And so this actually leads to an increased impetus to allow exemptions to these policies for Mexican workers because of the labor shortage that's going to result from this act. There was a literacy test imposed on immigrants in 
but uh, there was a push from businesses ultimately to exempt Mexicans from taking this literacy test. So they were exempted uh, first in the agricultural industry and then later mining and railroad workers were also exempted from taking this literacy test. And uh, this uh, was really significant because as you can see here, in the year 1917, and also there's immigration legislation in 1924, look at how much immigration into the United States from Mexico increases over these years. Ultimately, when U.S. policy deters immigration from places like Asia, and in the 1920s, they're also going to try to deter immigration from Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. This is a major reason why Mexicans are going to increasingly be pulled to the United States. The U.S. is continuing to industrialize. It needs workers in the southwest region for relatively low pay. And so Mexicans ultimately fill this gap.